Right, it's a minute past 11. Do you want to um, leave it another minute, Tracy, or would you want to start now? Um, do we think we've got everybody with us? Let's give it, just give, just give it another minute or so. Okay. I thought I'd lost connection then, I must admit, my heart went 10 to the dozen, man. Oh no, <laughs> as long as it doesn't cut me off as well. Yeah, no, so if you lose me, just carry on. Um, yeah, I can see the participants um, moving up now. Okay. Right, it's two minutes past. Uh, so we're going to kick off now. So thank you for attending our latest webinar on um, the CQS updates. Um, this is this session is going to be run by uh, Tracy, who is a lead CQS assessor. I'm Kay, a key account manager here at Jodasis, and I will be sending the slides out later. Um, but now I'm going to hand you straight over to Tracy to carry on. Tracy. Thank you very much, Kay. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Tracy Thompson. If you haven't come across me before, um, I talk an awful lot about CQS. Um, I am a lawyer, um, Lexel consultant and uh, Lexel assessor um, and was appointed as lead assessor for CQS back in 2019, uh, which seems an awful long time ago now. Um, so I'm going to spend the next um, hour or so just chatting through the changes um, which became uh, compulsory to follow in practice from uh, May 2022. Um, I'm also going to identify for you some patterns and trends. So I deal with um, a lot of CQS accredited practices, um, carry out a lot of uh, CQS um, reviews or mock assessments or, um, you know, whatever you want to call it, but effectively um, review the documents for, for practices and see an awful lot of uh, patterns and trends which um, which tend to mirror the results uh, which are being published from the actual assessments as well. Um, so I will take you through those patterns and trends so that hopefully that will give you some focus as to where you can look and make sure that you are compliant with CQS. And then I'll finish off by just um, letting you know um, what's next for, for CQS in the coming months. Um, so from housekeeping point of view, we can all keep microphones muted. That would be fantastic so that we don't um, all get to hear what goes on in the office. Um, if anybody does have any questions, you can pop them in the chat box. I'll pick them up. Alternatively, we should have time at the end if, uh, if anybody um, does have any questions and, and we can deal with them then. Um, OK, so let's make a start. So obviously, hopefully you'll all be aware that um, there were updates to the um, CQS scheme rules back in 2022, so about this time a year ago, the Law Society made an announcement and said that practices um, needed to ensure that they were uh, following the new core practice management standard, which came into effect um, and became compulsory from 1st of May 2022. And the Law Society also at that point um, took the opportunity to announce that the um, on-site assessments would formally launch from 1st of May also, so practices needed to make sure that they were um, assessment ready from that date. So the um, core practice management standard as a, as a document will always be you know, reviewed on an ongoing basis by the Law Society. It is intended to be a working document um, and whenever there are um, you know patterns and trends uh, emerging risks in residential conveyancing changes to legislation um, that kind of thing then that document will will um, be intended to be updated and and will evolve with any risks in residential conveyancing so that uh, obviously there are then corresponding procedures required to make sure that those risks can be mitigated in practice. Um, so obviously we had the original, uh, we had the 2019 update, we've had the 2022 update, um, but like I say, this is continuing uh, to be a, a working document. So there will be updates um, at some point in the future as the, um, the, the trends evolve. 
Um, so hopefully you are now all in a position whereby you have reviewed the core practice management standard and have done what you need to do in practice to make sure that you have um, everything in place to be able to demonstrate compliance. But um, I'm just going to take you through and identify for you what those changes were um, and that hopefully that will give you some, um, some idea as to um, the, the comparison that you needed to make between the 2019 and 2022 version of the standard. So the updates that we had um, back in May last year, there was an increase in the, um, the standard from six chapters through to seven. So if you are Lexel accredited, then um, you will now see that there is more of a, um, a mirror between the core practice management standard for CQS and the Lexel standard. So what we didn't have in the 2019 version was a people management section. Um, so that's completely new. Um, but what we do have is um, an increase in the um, individual core practice management standard requirements. So in the old version, we have 34 requirements. And with this particular version, um, we have 40 requirements. That doesn't necessarily mean that there are six new requirements. Um, some of the some of them have been split out. Um, you know, some have disappeared. Um, so it's um, it, you know it has been reformatted and uh, and actually flows a lot better than the 2019 version. Um, so in terms of those changes, um, there were some uh, significant uh, changes to to uh, certain areas of the standard, which I'll I'll pick out for those. Um, for, for those for you today. Um, but what we did see is the whole reformatting. So we saw the renumbering of, um, of uh, requirements and we saw everything being moved into the, um, to the particular chapter where it sits best. And, and like I say, it does flow a lot better from the 2019 version. So no, um, no significant updates to uh, section uh, one, which is structure and strategy, and section two, which is financial management. But I will take you through the rest of the, um, the changes which are sit in the other chapters. So information management security. So this is chapter three. So what we did have here um, against the old um, 2019 version of the core practice management standard is um, slight changing. So we have um, a requirement to manage um, personal data. So ensure that we've got data protection policy that complies with legislation. Um, and then we have this um, requirement to ensure that um, personnel are trained on information management and security. And also that personnel are kept aware of um, cybercrime and, uh, and how they can affect the practice. So if any of you are familiar with the old core practice management standard, this particular requirement, um, which sat at 6.1, um, was a lot more comprehensive. And one of the things that I want you to take away from today, um, in, if you haven't already um, realised, is that what we have now is we have a couple of parts of this core practice management standard whereby there is, you know, a, um, a lot of a lot of the detail has been stripped out. So, for example, the old 6.1, which is now um, 3.1, data protection in the previous standard um, dealt with, you know, um, subject access requests, data breaches, data protection, impact assessment, and there was a lot of detail. Um, so we had 6.1, A, B, C, D, E, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, you may think that because that information has now actually been stripped out of the actual core practice management standard requirements um, that it, it's not needed anymore. And I have actually seen um, some documentation recently um, whereby there was um, there was a statement that I read that basically said um, CQS no longer requires you to have this in place. That's not the case at all. The standard itself, the core practice management standards uh, requirements may have been reworded, but you must always read the corresponding guidance notes that the Law Society have put together, because what that does is it deals with the detail of the minimum expectations that we expect to see in practice. So whilst you know the uh, the specific um, sub requirements might have been stripped out, they still sit in the guidance notes, and actually we do still expect to see all of those things that would ensure that you comply with legislation, like 
you know, procedures for dealing with data breaches and procedures for dealing with uh, data subject access requests, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so just don't make sure you realize that, um, that those guidance notes do sit within the standard and, and those are the minimum expectations of what we, what we want to be seeing in practice. Um, but make sure that obviously you deal with um, the new elements, which is ensuring that, um, that personnel are kept um, up to date with, with cybercrime and obviously how that affects, um, how that affects the practice because we all know we're only as good as the, um, the links that people click on. So moving on to 3.2, um, again, um, you know, slight change. Um, the old standard, which was um, 6.2, had a lot of information, subsections in relation to user accounts and software updates um, and you know, um, firewalls and dealing with all the, the technical side of information management security that might have been stripped out of the actual core practice management standard wording but it does still sit in the guidance notes so again all of that information is still required and that is what you should be looking at to make sure that you are actually cross-referencing and putting everything in your information management security policy that that should be in there um practices should be accredited against cyber essentials so if you look through the core practice management standard there there's just kind of various um wording um, always go back to the wording of the standard if you're unsure. So you will see within um, CQS and Lexel that there is the wording must and should. So if the standard says that practices must have, as in here, must have an information management security policy, that is compulsory for everybody. So it doesn't matter what profile practice you are, what size, um, you know, that, that is compulsory for all CQS accredited practices. However, um, we then go on to say and should be accredited against cyber essentials. So the should is an optional element. And um, if you choose as a practice to not adopt a particular element that is a should um, in the standard, then you need to firstly um, document why you've chosen to not adopt that particular requirement. And then obviously be prepared to have a sensible conversation about why you would choose um, to, to not adopt it. So for example, cyber essentials, you know, don't want to spend 400 pounds on, on cyber essentials accreditation um, isn't really an acceptable um, reason as to why you would choose to not um, adopt the, um, the requirement. So um, I've also had conversations with people where they've said, uh, well, we've, you know, we've just arranged insurance, so we don't need cyber essentials accreditation. Um, and the point there being that insurance is something that, you know, helps you after the event, whereas cyber essentials accreditation is measured against a set of um, controls and measures that you would have in place to prevent the, um, the act taking place in, in the first place. So, um, you know, not wanting to spend £400 on cyber essentials accreditation um, when actually if you don't have those controls and measures in place, and then you find yourself uh, in a situation whereby you've lost client money, you need to replace that client money immediately, then you need to phone the SRA, and then you can make steps to uh, to claim on your insurance. You know, do all practices that don't have cyber essentials accreditation have the ability to replace that client money immediately? You know, it depends on the amount, obviously, but it's certainly something to think about. Um, also, it's worth noting that at the moment um, in Lexel, Cyber Essentials is also assured. Um, there is the prospect that Cyber Essentials will be becoming compulsory and will be a must um, in Lexel um, in future versions. And that is something that's being discussed at the moment um, with the new version 7, which is, uh, is due to be issued by the Law Society imminently it's likely that cyber essentials will be a must and therefore compulsory. Um, I imagine therefore going forward that in future editions of the core practice management standard for CQS accredited practices cyber essentials um, is possibly also likely to become um, a must rather than a should. So um, practices that don't have it should consider getting ahead of the game and uh, and making sure that they, they do uh, take steps to become cyber essentials accredited. Um, we have a new requirement at 3.3. So this didn't exist in the old um, core practice management standard. And this is 
um, having a register of all the plans, policies and procedures that are contained within the core practice management standard, make sure that you have a named person responsible for each of them, and then um, ensure that you've got a documented procedure that sets out, you know, how the review of those plans, policies and procedures will take place. So, you know, quite simply, a paragraph in your office manual um, that sets out that, you know, we're CQS accredited, we have corresponding uh, register of plans, policies and procedures. These are the people are named um, are responsible for each of those and on, and let's say, an annual basis. Um, we will undertake a review of each of those plans, policies and procedures, taking into account um, changes in regulation, changes in legislation, identification of patterns and trends in the practice, um, changes to quality standards, um, you know, emerging risks in residential conveyancing, et cetera, et cetera. So just doc document something along those lines to set out that actually this is what we'll do and this is how we'll do it. Um, moving on to people management, as I say, this is um, a new chapter in the standard, didn't appear in the 2019 version, um, although we did have some requirements um, that, uh, that did appear elsewhere. So we have the requirements to have a learning and development policy in place. Um, the additions to the 2022 standard um, include ensuring that appropriate training is provided to personnel, ensuring that supervisors and managers receive appropriate training and make sure that you've got a procedure in place to evaluate training. So the, then this particular requirement then goes on to talk about um, the uh, ensuring that um, CQS training is completed on time um, and making sure that everybody is aware of the core practice management standard and the conveyance and protocols and how they comply in practice, etc., which did appear in the old version of the standard. Um, I have only taken, for the purposes of today's slides, the sections um, and the specific numbers which have changed, just so it gives you some, um, some clarity. So that's, um, this is uh, an addition to, to the standard. Um, we also have another uh, completely new requirement, which is um, dealing with induction. So this didn't appear anywhere in the previous um, version of the standard, although it does appear um, in a similar format in, in Lexel. Um, so you need to make sure that you conduct an appropriate induction, not only for new starters in the firm, but also for anybody that is transferring roles within the practice. So always give consideration to, you know, specific training requirements and key policies that are pertinent to working in the residential conveyancing department. Um, always give consideration to the likes of uh, trainees when they're, you know, they're moving around the practice and they're doing different seats. You know, they might have been in crime and family or litigation and then move into residential conveyancing. So, you know, they are transferring a role because actually their immediate training requirements for residential conveyancing and the key policies that they are going to be uh, needing to follow and, and be aware of are going to be different to, to those previous departments that they've worked in. So key policies, you know, such as dealing with lenders, um, leasehold, anti-money laundering, property and mortgage fraud, SDLT, all of those things that they wouldn't really necessarily have been exposed to in, uh, in previous seats. So that's a new requirement um, that didn't appear in the previous standard. Move on to section five, which is um, risk management, which is the, um, I suppose, the, the uh, meatiest section of the core practice management standard. And there have been um, a few amendments. So here in uh, 5.8, which is the um, supervision procedures, we have the addition of ensuring that personnel adhere to the Law Society conveyancing protocols. So in the previous standard and, uh, and in this particular standard as well, we have the requirements in learning and development to make sure that everybody is aware of the protocols, but actually we now have this new um, requirement to make sure that everybody is actually following it. So you decide as a practice how you do that, how you manage um, ensuring that personnel adhere to the protocols. It may be that you use your case management system and workflows. Um, or you know, your procedures for checking that ad adherence could filter into um, your file review procedures, for example. Um, so the thing with CQS is that you know, this is not prescriptive. The, the standard doesn't tell you that you must do something in a certain way. Um, so which is why I say always come back to the wording. 
because it's about you as a practice defining how are we going to work this, you know, so that it actually works for our practice and the way we work and the systems we use, which of course is different from one firm to the next to the next. So you decide how you're going to ensure that personnel adhere to the protocols, but obviously make sure that as with all requirements where it uses the word procedure, that it is documented. And that's something I'll touch upon um, shortly. Um, we then have some amendments to the um, requirements for anti-money laundering. So obviously we, you know, we, we have a, um, quite a substantial um, subsections within 5.12. Um, as I say, I've only picked out the areas where there are um, updates or changes. So we have um, a requirement now for making sure that we have a procedure for checking and analysing the source of funds slash wealth and keeping on file the evidence obtained and that documented analysis. So in the previous standard, we needed procedures for dealing with source of funds. So this is an expansion. So again, think, look at the wording. You know, we need to set out our steps that how our fee earners are going to um, check and analyse source of funds and source of wealth. So make sure that they are aware that there is a difference. So obtaining evidence of source of funds is um, having a bank statement on to show that there's hundred thousand pounds in HSBC. Um, obtaining evidence of source of wealth is evidence of how that hundred thousand pound that sits in HSBC has been accumulated. And then there needs to be uh, this needs to be recorded on the file, but there needs to be a documented analysis as well. So something I always um, say to practices. Now, if you've got you know, the proverbial £100,000 sat in HSBC and the client explains, this is what my, you know, how I've accumulated this money, this is the source of wealth, and you get evidence of that, then what you do need is this documented analysis. So it should be a summary, some kind of synopsis that actually shows £100,000 in this account, this is from this um, activity, have this evidence, this much is from here, I have this evidence. And actually, if you show that working out, um, then, you know, that is what the NCA are going to want to see. It's what the SRA wants to see. And it is um, what would be defined as a, as a documented analysis. And the other thing is as well that from a business owner's perspective, you know, um, it may be that in two years time, somebody comes along, looks at this file, your fee earner, you know, has, has moved on somewhere else or, you know, they've retired, but... If there is a bank statement showing one hundred thousand pounds in in um, in HSBC and nothing else, no documented analysis, no evidence of the conversations that was had with the client as to the accumulation of that money and you know where it came from, then as a business owner, MLRO, you know you are going to find yourself having to have a conversation whereby your file is pretty much silent on the point of where that money has come from or how it's how it's been accumulated. So, um, but even if your piano is still there, um, then, you know, we can't remember every conversation we have with clients. And, you know, so actually that documented analysis is really key evidence to be able to identify, this is what I had, this is the conversations that I, um, I had with the client, this is the evidence that I have. And actually taking all of this into account, I didn't have any suspicions of money laundering, I didn't have any knowledge of money laundering. And that's something that's, um, that's really important. Um, and of course, that particular requirement can also sit hand in hand with having to have a procedure for ensuring that there is a, um, an anti-money laundering risk assessment present on every file. So this is, it's a legislative requirement. It's always been a legislative requirement in the Money Laundering Regulations 2017. Um, it's Regulation 28. In CQS, in the Core Practice Management Standard of 2019, there wasn't this specific um, requirements that you needed to have an AML risk assessment, even though it did appear in the legislation. So now um, this brings focus um, to the point of ensuring that every matter does have a documented AML risk assessment, dealing with all things AML. So, you know, PEP status, CDD, um, EDD, um, you know, electronic ID verification results, um, source of funds, source of wealth, all of those things that, that fall within um, anti-money laundering and, and those um, risks that we need to be assessing on an ongoing basis throughout the, um, the course of the transaction. So obviously you can tie that document, so whatever your risk assessment looks like, into 
um, you know, your documented analysis of source of funds because the two things do, do go hand in hand. So those are two um, specific requirements that if you haven't already reviewed what you're doing in practice to make sure that you comply with um, uh, core practice management standard 22, then those are the areas that you need to look at. Moving on to 513, which is property and mortgage fraud. Um, there is also the, um, the specific requirement that you need to have a documented fraud risk assessment on every file, demonstrating that uh, consideration has been taken into account of risk associated with the transaction, um, the party, uh, the other party and the client. So this needs to be all things property and mortgage fraud. And when we are completing a risk assessment on every file in relation to property and mortgage fraud, we need to make sure that we're not only just thinking about um, our client, but we're also thinking of any potential um, significant risks of fraud on the other side as well, which is, is um, also embedded in 513. So again, your risk assessment, make sure it gives consideration to, um, to all of those um, risks that the firm will be exposed to in relation to mortgage and property fraud, but also that um, you are thinking about when we are acting for the buyer, for example, that we are giving consideration to are there any significant risks of fraud um, on the other side? So think Dreamfar, for example, you know, we are we're buying the property, it's high value, it's unencumbered, um, it's empty, the seller lives abroad, you know, those are red flags that hopefully everybody's been trained on, so they would recognize their red flags. You get this information from speaking to your clients on an ongoing basis. So you pick up this information. It's all about know your client. And then that's when you can identify, actually, there is a potential significant risk of the other side. So we document that on our fraud risk assessment. And then, of course, we follow whatever steps we've got in place internally to make sure that that uh, file is managed and monitored um, accordingly, appro uh, appropriate to the, the level of risk that's, um, that's assigned to it. So that's, um, that's something you need to consider for fraud. Um, in relation to stamp duty, <clears throat> SDLT, LTT, um, we need to make sure that we now have a procedure um, for giving clients clear and timely advice um, on SDLT, and we need to set out to them the meaning of first-time buyer and major interest in a dwelling. So all those questionnaires that I see that go out to the clients and say, you know, do you consider yourself to be a first time buyer, but they don't actually tell the client what a first time buyer is, that client, you know, could argue they're not making an informed decision. So make sure that you review your documents and, uh, and set out that information to the client. And then uh, the new addition, making sure that you have a procedure in place um, to provide a clear written SDLT calculation um, to the client at the outset. So, um, so those are the new requirements in relation to SDLT. The other requirements were sat in the 2019 version. 516, so this is dealing with leasehold property. <clears throat> we need to make sure that um, the information that we're giving to clients is full, clear and accessible written advice. So that's new. So make sure that that is what's happening. The spirit of full, clear and accessible written advice um, would not be to send a copy of a 47 page lease and say, here's a copy of your lease, make sure that you comply with the restrictive covenants contained in schedule four on page 12. You know, that's not the spirit of uh, what full, clear and access accessible written advice is. Um, so you do need to make sure that you give full um, information to the client, um, taking into account the fact that you know, they may not necessarily understand um you know what restrictive covenants are um so you need to set them out to the client you need to explain to the client um the difference between freehold and leasehold property so this is new um and set out to them you know in full in clear um uh, plain english any other key information that's appropriate to the particular lease as well so that's new and then of course give consideration to any other matters um that are specific to the lease um, taking into account um, current lender requirements regarding leasehold transactions. Um, and I suspect that's probably something that's a hot topic at the moment in relation to um, high rise flats and, um, and flats that are over five stories. 
et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so do review your leasehold property policy and make sure that you are actually giving full um, information to the client and give it to them early on as well. Um, moving on to client care. So the changes here. So we have um, a bit of a repeat of what I mentioned earlier on when I was talking about data protection and information management security. So we had in the previous um, standard, you know, you must communicate to the following, um, following information to, to the clients. And we had, you know, A, B, C, D, E, you know, lots of different things, including timescales, agree appropriate level of service, um, name of the person who's dealing with the matter and their status, name and status of the supervisor, um, et cetera, et cetera. So again, just to bring that to your attention, um, because I have read somewhere that um, you now no longer need to advise clients of X, Y, and Z. You do, of course you do, it's regulatory um, requirements. Um, and, um, but again, if you refer to the guidance notes, then you will see that the specific detail is still included, it's just been moved, that's all. Um, so make sure you don't strip anything out from your um, your client care letter or your terms of business that um, that you have been telling, telling those clients. Um, dealing with lenders, so we had some new requirements uh, brought into dealing with lenders policy. So we need to explain that the lender is also a client uh, of the practice where obviously you're acting for the client um, and the, the lender. And um, we now have a new procedure whereby um, fee earners are required to ensure that they check part two of the UK Finance Handbook um, prior to exchange of contracts, but they need to make sure that they record it on the file that that check has been carried out. So again, you know, entirely up to you as to how this works in your practice. It might be um, a manual procedure, in which case you need to give consideration to who makes the check, how is it made, when is it made, where is it recorded, what evidence is there, et cetera, et cetera. Or it might be that you use supporting software to um, to undertake this particular requirement. So again, you know, have a look at what it is you do and make sure that that is, um, that is documented accordingly. Um, we need to have a complaints handling procedure, obviously. Um, we've had that for a long time, um, but we do have some additions here. So we now have to ensure that we explain to the clients that the complaint will be dealt with promptly, fairly and free of charge. And also that we need to make sure that we comply with uh, 8.4 and 8.5 of the Code of Conduct for Solicitors. So this is ensuring that we um, identify to the client that they have the, um, the ability to refer to the legal ombudsman. Um, that um, you have a, um, a, a stance in relation to whether you will subscribe to alternative dispute resolution, mediation or not, and what that looks like, and also making sure that the, um, the complaint is dealt with free of charge, which is uh, 8.5 of the Code of Conduct Solicitors. So, so that's new. So just go back and make sure that you review not only your complaints handling procedure, but that you have internally, but also whatever it is that you're publishing on the um, website as well to make sure that the two things um, are identical and, and they are mirrored. Um, we have an expansion as well, whereby um, internally you need to make sure that you are recording all complaints, you're identifying the cause of the problem, you're offering appropriate redress and obviously correcting any unsatisfactory procedures and you're using that information then to be able to feed into your um, annual review of risk data, which um, is at 5.17 in the core practice management standard. So full documentation in relation to complaints, you know, root cause analysis, everything, you know, everything happens for a reason. So we need to get to the bottom of why something has happened and then obviously make sure that we take steps to put into place procedures so that we can reduce the risk of it happening again. Um, file and case management. So this is section seven of the standard. And uh, we have a new requirement, uh, which didn't appear at all in the old um, core practice management standard. And that is to have a procedure in place to minimize the risk of avoidable requisitions from HMLR. So obviously we're talking here about, you know, two documents, Tracy, you know, no E in one document, E in the other document. Um, so, you know, those silly requisitions that um, land registry could do without obviously you know they need to catch up with uh, with uh, the backlog so you know make sure that you've got some kind of post um, completion post SDLT payment um, 
procedure in place to make sure that there is, you know, a cross-reference, a, a check, HMLR have their own um, uh, AP1 checklist that you could incorporate into some procedures to make sure that, the, you know, that you are taking steps to, to cross-reference, make sure that signatures are, you know, witnessed correctly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and obviously set out, um, you know, where fee earners can, um, can um, access guidance for, for complex um, applications, et cetera. We also have the new requirement to make sure that we've got procedures in place to ensure clients are advised that they can register up to three service addresses. Um, so see lots of different things in practice here in terms of um, sometimes I see, you know, the title information document comes in, goes out to the client, here's a copy of the title information document, you know, make sure that you keep your service addresses up to date, um, you know, you can, you can uh, register up to three, et cetera. Um, and I've also seen it reports on the contract, uh, reports entitled to the to client, but also um, a good idea might be to update the client information questionnaire that you're sending out at the beginning. So at least you can get that information from them at the outset and then obviously incorporate that into the documentation going forward. And then, of course, at the end, when you send in the title information document, make sure that you do remind them that they should keep those service addresses um, up to date. So those are the, um, the more significant changes um, from the 2019 core practice management standard through to, uh, to the version that you should now be following in practice. Obviously, we also had the announcement that the on-site assessments would be commencing um, and practices should be assessment ready from the 1st of May. Hopefully you are some way, if not all the way to being in that position of being assessment ready. Um, the, we uh, the law society carried out a pilot back in 2019 so um uh, the law society carried out assessments themselves also uh, the team of uh, cqs assessors myself and, and the team also carried out on-site assessments as a pilot from 2019 through to november 2019 through to february 2020 and um and we saw you know some interesting practices we saw practices that you know all different profiles um, and we saw some really good practices, um, you know, that still needed a little bit of guidance in terms of being able to meet the requirements of the, the standard. And we also saw some practices who needed a lot more engagement and a lot more focus um, to ensure that they were in a position to be able to demonstrate um, compliance. Um, there was always going to be a period of review and reflection on, on the back of that pilot. But of course, you know, a month later, COVID struck and um, and the formal launch of the on-site assessments um, was shelved uh, for a certain period of time because, of course, you've all had enough to do with SDLT holidays and, and obviously, a, you know, a very um, active property market in the last couple of years. So, um, so the Law Society haven't wanted to, you know, add any additional stress to conveyance and practices. Um, so have kind of left the, the formal on-site assessments um, until a later date um, from when they were originally supposed to happen. So, um, you know, the news is that the uh, on-site assessments did commence in May 22. They are being carried out um, as we speak. Only currently small numbers of, um, of um, reviews on-site are being carried out. And it is different profiles of practices that are being assessed. So um, there is no particular rhyme or reason the Law Society make the selections based on information that they have in their possession. So it may be information that they have from, um, from yourself as a practice, based on the information that you provide to them as, um, you know, on your renewal or your reaccreditation application form, or it may be that they are, are in possession of information from a third party stakeholder. Um, and it's the Law Society that make those selections, or it could be completely random. So they have always said that there'll be, you know, reactive and, and proactive um, assessment um, selections. Um, there has been, um, from the outset, really, a very um, early emergence of, of core patterns and trends, which, as I say, um, I see on a very regular basis. I work with probably a couple of uh, practices a week um, and see the same things um, that are emerging from those um, from those practices. Before I just talk to you through what those um, emerging patterns and trends are, one thing that I want you to take from today, if you've never heard me talk about CQS before, and that is um, there is there is a method to demonstrating compliance, not only with CQS or 
Lexel, but um, but you know, evidencing that you are doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Um, and I call it a three tier process. And that says you do, do as you say, and provide the evidence. And I find that's just the easiest way of being able to uh, to explain it to people. So say as you do is all your documented policies and procedures. Do as you say is making sure that you're actually doing what it is that you say that you do in those documented policies and procedures. And then providing the evidence is the third tier. So all of these things should align. Um, so say as you do, do as you say, they do need to align. So if you have a policy, for example, that says, um, we you know we do a b and c and then actually in practice you do e f and g then what you find is that your policy is not aligned with your operational practice so that is where you would then be identified as having a non-compliance um so you would either need to fix your documentation if what you're doing in practice is what you're supposed to be doing in practice um or you fix what's happening in practice to make sure it aligns with your documentation so again you know there needs to be that alignment. So say as you do, do as you say is key, but also just as important as making sure that you provide evidence so that, um, you know, I could come along and look at a file on a Saturday afternoon with nobody being able to talk over my shoulder to say we would have done that, or this is what that meant, or, you know, that £100,000 in HSBC, you know, I know my clients, I know where they get the money from, that, you know, if it's not evidenced on the file, then it didn't happen. So, um, and, and you know, that's my words from, from, the, um, from the mouth of an auditor. So always make sure you've got these three tiers in place. So you have all your documented policies and procedures, you make sure you follow them in practice, and then you make sure that there is evidence that those procedures have been followed. Um, so again, you know, I um, touched upon it earlier on, where you see a requirement that says practices must have a policy, then that has to be written down, but also where it says practices must have a policy um, which must contain a procedure for, so you think about SDLT, for example, so 515, status you know is that you must have an sdl2 policy and then there are four separate procedures so those procedures are a written set of steps that you will take to achieve that particular requirement in practice so basically you need to set out the steps that you take to achieve something and it does need to be written down so um so just be mindful if, if you see the word procedure that it has to be written down and um and then making sure that you've got that evidence in place, because quite often we will uh, have conversations with practices that would say, you know, oh, but I would have done, you know, again, if it's not evidence, it didn't happen. So an example of that where I see um, a lot of non-compliances is where you have the requirement to check the identity of the other side's conveyancer. Um, so set out your stance in your policy, make sure it happens in practice, and then we pick up the file and there's no evidence. Um, and that is actually one of the uh, areas where there's um, a lot of non compliances because the answer is, well, I would have checked, you know, or I know that person. Well, if you've got a two tiered approach where a fee owner is able to um, self certify that they do know the identity of the other side's conveyance and make sure that it's documented and make sure there is some evidence on the file because otherwise it just looks like it's been overlooked. Um, so demonstrating compliance, three tier process, make sure that you um, you take that away from today if you take away nothing else. So common areas of non-compliance. So these are the patterns and trends that, um, that I see on a very regular basis that the Law Society talk about, um, that they see, and um, some of them will align with um, some of the changes that I've just mentioned to you. Um, but in particular, um, areas that you might want to just look at in practice to make sure that you know you don't fall within these patterns and trends. So business continuity plan testing, um, make sure that you actually have a documented business continuity plan, but also that in that plan that you do set out um, how you are going to test the business continuity plan, because it is a specific requirement that you have annual testing of the plan. Um, because of course, with all of these things, there's no point in finding out it doesn't work when you're actually in the middle of a serious business interruption. Um, I also see um, uh, lack of evidence for testing. So when you do test your business continuity plan, make sure that you document it and it's evidenced. Um, quite often firms will have a conversation about, well, you know, do you expect us to burn the building down to, to make sure that it, it works? Um, of course not. 
Um, but scenario testing is a really good um, option. So sit around the table, have a conversation with, you know, the the cult, the coffer, the practice manager, the IT department, HR, and you know, do some scenario testing. One of the scenario tests, which I would always recommend that uh, that you carry out, is um, you come into the office. There's a fax um, that says, you know, you've been the victim of a ransomware attack. Don't turn on your computers. Okay, so I'm not entirely sure what um, what language the uh, criminals would use, but you know, work on that basis that you you know you've you've been subject to a ransomware attack. Um, and what do you do next? And then brainstorm. You know, how would we be able to continue to run this business? You know, taking into account your own profile, your own systems. It might be that your phones um, are, you know, uh, linked into the server as well as the computers. And so, you know, again, get IT involved and document it. You know, what would work? What wouldn't work? How would we how would we work? You know, be able to continue to run the business. Financial verification procedures. Um, Quite often here, I see a lack of um, documentation setting out how um, bank account details are checked, for example. So, you know, if you are, uh, you've selling the property, you've completed, you need to send £600,000 back to um, Joe Bloggs. Um, you know, what is the process that happens in terms of checking Joe Bloggs' bank details um, to verify them, to make sure that you are actually going to send £600,000 to the right person? So quite often see documentation is missing in that regard. Uh, although pleasingly, there is usually operational procedures um, in place. It's just the documentation quite often that is, um, is missing there. And also giving consideration of high risk third countries as well and money coming in uh, from high risk third countries and payments being made out to high risk third countries. And quite often practices will say, oh, we don't deal with anybody that lives in a high risk third country. OK, that's fine. But actually, what about somebody that lives in this country, but actually their money is coming from a high risk third country? What steps taken to ensure that you've got additional um, procedures in place? So that's something that um, that is uh, is a pattern. Um, anti money laundering practice wide risk assessment. Um, so make sure that you are up to speed with your practice wide risk assessment. We had the LSAG uh, Legal Sector Affinity Group guidance that was um, sanctioned um, by the uh, Treasury in, uh, I think it was July, um, summer 2022. So, um, so that has now been, um, been signed off and, and finalized. So that is a trigger for reviewing your practice by risk assessment. So if you haven't done um, then do that. Obviously, make sure it's up to date. It deals with you know current um, issues like you know conflict and sanctions. If you've not got a separate sanctions policy um, and um, cryptocurrency, coming across more and more practices now where they are being approached by um, by clients to say I'm purchasing a property and I'm using Bitcoin or you know other cryptocurrencies. Set out what your stance is uh, in that practice wide risk assessment, and then of course incorporate. Um, incorporate it into your AML policy. Um, matter level risk assessments and um, that AML um, uh, risk assessment that you need to have in place. So I do see um, practices that A, don't have one or B, they have one which is inadequate or doesn't demonstrate um, consideration throughout the lifetime of the matter. So I see a lot of um, AML risk assessments that are actually completed at the beginning. And that's all about the onboarding. That's about, you know, yeah, we've got the client's ID, we've done our electronic ID verification, uh, whatever it is that's happening in practice, and then that's it, it stops. The SRA um, want to see ongoing monitoring and engagement with that process because, of course, you know, 12 weeks down the line, you've got a lot more information from the client, you've done all your evidence, got all your evidence of source of funds, source of wealth, you know, that documented analysis can be fed into that risk assessment. Um, and that's something that um, that needs to be improved um, in the majority of practices that uh, that I've come across. Um, and also, quite often, I see a lack of um, the firm's stance in relation to undertaking an AML independent audit function or the um, appointment of a money laundering compliance officer, which is part of the legislation, um, but also uh, falls under um, CQS and Lexel as well. So you need to set out what uh, what your stance is in, in regard to that. 
Property and mortgage fraud, again, the uh, property and mortgage fraud matter level risk assessment is something that is quite often um, absent in a lot of practices to so make sure that you are reviewing what you have in place um, and that that matter level risk assessment is, is adequate and, um, and up to the job. Um, but also incorporate into that um, checking the identity of the other side's conveyancer. Make sure that everybody is aware that when you do check, um, you need to make sure that there's some evidence. So that demonstrates that that check has been carried out. And if you do have a two tiered approach, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a fee owner and I, you know, I know that um, that fee owner, you know, I know the identity of the other side's conveyancer. Then, you know, how how does anybody that's reviewing the file know that? Because it might be that, you know, equally, I don't know that person. I've actually just forgotten to check or I haven't put the evidence on the file. So make sure there is some proactive action whereby if you do allow the fee owner to identify that they know that person or they know the identity of the conveyancer, then it's on a checklist somewhere. There's some some evidence that, you know, certified by the fee owner that I know the identity of that person. Um, conflict policies, um, quite often I see um, uh, an absence in policies of uh, firms when they're acting on both sides of the matter. If you don't act on both sides of the matter, um, then set that out and, and that's great. If you do, then you need to set out in what circumstances, who authorises, you know, what steps are taken, you know, the lockdown case management system, different fee owners, different offices, different supervisors consent of the client, et cetera, et cetera. Um, quite often that is um, that is um, missing out of policies. SDLT procedures, let's keep my eye on the time. Um, lack of LTT, so quite often we will see um, SDLT policy doesn't actually refer to LTT. Um, and of course, if on occasion, you know, or more often you deal with LTT, then make sure that there is that top of mind awareness and VNs are aware that actually, you know, there is LTT as well. And this is property in Wales, and therefore that should trigger a response that we, you know, we follow a different path here. We don't apply first time buyer relief, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so look at your documentation and make sure that you do uh, include LTT. Second pair of eyes, so um, verification or verifying the SDLT calculation is intended to be a second pair of eyes. Um, so quite often we will see that that is either not happening or if it is happening, it's not necessarily being recorded. Um, so again, just look at what you're doing there. And then um, cross-checking the consideration um, in the contract to transfer the SDLT return against the payment made from um, client account to identify that the right amount of SDLTT or LTT has been paid. And this is intended to be a post um, payment procedure. If any of you um, get Legal Futures newsletter about six weeks ago, I think on a Friday afternoon, the newsletter um, was published and incorporated um, a scenario whereby uh, a member of staff was banned from working in law firms, um, having siphoned off, I think it was £338,000 worth of SDLT payments by amending uh, documentation. If this procedure had been in place um, and had been um, carried out by the right person, um, then that, um, you know, that fraudulent activity would have been picked up very quickly. Um, so make sure that you are actually ensuring that you've got this procedure in place, it is done, it is recorded, and obviously um, there is evidence on the file. Leasehold procedures, um, I'm not seeing much explanation to clients of the difference between freehold and leasehold property. So if you just update, uh, look at what your uh, documentation to the client says, and again, make sure that you do give full, clear advice. I read um, some documentation last week, which was pretty much, you know, here's your, here's your lease, um, comply with the restrictive covenants and uh, ground rent will um, will increase in accordance with Schedule Two. You know, it, it, for for a lay client, it's not a great way of being able to uh, to explain things to them. And of course, the SRA did put out guidance, I think, probably about eighteen months ago, to say that they do not consider this to be um, good practice. Reporting to lenders, obviously, we've got the updates um, for the 22 version of the standard, making sure that you are checking part two, 
where that's recorded, I don't see, I, I see very, very little evidence of this procedure actually being followed in practice, although, um, you know, operationally I'm confident in, in a lot of practices it is happening, but again, if it's not recorded, if there's no evidence, it didn't happen. Um, and uh, detailing those reporting requirements as well. So just making sure that actually your documentation does set out that if we need to report to the lenders, then we firstly check, you know, is the reporting form and then we need to tell them what's the problem, what's our legal advice and what are the solutions that are open to them and how much is it going to cost and how long is it going to take. Um, so make sure that that is all uh, documented and of course if you do need to report to the lender ensure that that is, uh, is followed through. Um, we have the requirement at 7.5 in the standard to ensure that you identify two clients of the ability for them to Register the property with HMLR Property Alert Service and um, quite often see closing letters that do not include that information. It is a closing procedure. It's intended to be done at the end when it's you know important to the client that they've now got an asset. Um, and also quite often we'll see that uh, policies are lacking in, in that regard and don't actually talk about at the end of the, the matter. We need to write to the client. We send them a copy of the title information document. We, you know, do all the other closing procedure bits, you know, tell them about future storage and, you know, all that kind of thing. But HMLR Property Alert Service, make sure that you include that as well. And of course, that new requirement, which I just mentioned to you um, a while ago about um, avoiding HMLR requisitions. Um, so in terms of an actual operational procedure, not seeing um, a lot of evidence that there is a, a procedure in place. And of course, in terms of documentation as well, um, there's a distinct lack of um, documentation for practices setting out how they intend to ensure that they can try to reduce HMLR requisitions. So those are the patterns and trends. Um, just to finish us off, um, just to let you know what is um, next in store for CQS accredited practices. And this is something that you really do need to take note of. Um, the Law Society have also already sent out some information, I think in October, um, to state that the application process for CQS is going to change and that information um, is due imminently. So there is going to be the launch of an online portal. Um, so for a long time, obviously, we've had kind of a paper-based um, exercise um, completing the application form, sending it off to the Law Society. It might be that your broker hasn't yet provided you with evidence of your six years claims history, um, any claims and notifications, et cetera, et cetera. And you might put that that's to follow. Um, the new portal, which um, like I say, will be, will be launched shortly, um, will um, require practices to make sure that they actually have all of that documentation at the point of submission and all applications will need to be submitted by the firm's CQS expiry date. So um, firstly, make sure you are aware of what your CQS expiry date is. Secondly, when you get notified of the portal going live, which will be notified to the, um, the firm's SRO, make sure that you um, start to, to look at that um, straight away, particularly if your practice is due for, um, for renewal or reaccreditation uh, within you know the, the following few months. Um, so you take note of what your expiry date is. You will need to make sure that the application is submitted by that expiry date. Otherwise, your accreditation will automatically lapse. There is the ability for practices, or there will be the ability for practices to make an application to the Law Society for a one-off, one-month extension, um, and that will be it. There will be no further extensions available. Again, you must make sure that you submit within that one month extension if that is granted to you. There will be an administration charge levied by the Law Society for that. I think it's about £113. Um, so, um, but again, you need to make sure that uh, that you, you stick to the deadlines there and that you don't let that lapse. Um, what's worth noting is that firstly, the portal will be, uh, will be sophisticated in so far as it will be set, um, set into sections. So it will be the same um, portal for all practices, regardless of where you are in your CQS cycle. There'll be new questions um, and those questions will need to be answered and any supporting information that is required will need to be uploaded. And in each um, question, 
so answer and supporting evidence, only then will that particular um, question be answered um, effectively and the, you know, the cross will turn to a tick, for example. Um, only once the whole application form through the portal has been completely fully completed and all documents um, uploaded as required, will all of the crosses turn to ticks and then um, will the submit button become active for practices to be able to submit your application. So it is real, it really is going to be a bit of a game changer for practices this. So you, know, you need to make sure that you are organized, you've got everything, start you know way in advance um, than you know maybe you did do previously um, and make sure that everything is submitted before that expiry date because as I say um, indications are that if you don't, then your CQS accreditation um, will lapse. Um, and that's not something that any practice needs to be in a position to have to deal with. Um, so the portal itself will be intelligent. Um, so the information that is provided will be, um, the, the Law Society will be able to gather the, um, the intelligence, the data, they will be able to report on it. And obviously what that will allow them to do is to uh, profile a practice's um, risk level, or exposure to risk, or identify where there are patterns and trends, or identify where there are potential issues, and um, a practice might need some further engagement, and then it's likely that that information will then feed through to the on-site assessment uh, selection process, um, and actually, it, it's that information then that is likely to, to profile practice so that the Law Society know um, who they're going to carry out on-site assessments with next. Um, so that's really important to note. Um, and the other thing as well, um, which um, I think was only notified a couple of weeks ago, was that there is a new SRO exam. So even if your SRO has previously been approved, then um, the new SRO exam will apply to all senior responsible officers um, in situ. And that is something that can be accessed through the um, um, learning uh, portal through the Law Society. And uh, I think it is a 90 minute exam um, that needs to be carried out in practice um, as, as part of the ongoing um, improvements with uh, with the whole CQS scheme. So um, you would please know that brings me to the end of the session. I'm two minutes over, but I think we did start two minutes late. Um, so thank you very much for listening to me. I know I talk a lot, um, but hopefully it's all valuable information for you and you've taken something away from, from that today. Um, I'd like to thank um, Jodasis for allowing me to talk to you for an hour about, um, about those changes and, and what you need to be mindful of going forward. And if anyone has any questions, then feel free to type them into the chat box, um, talk to me. If you have any questions after the event, then um, just drop um, Jodasis um, an email or contact me directly, and then we will be able to uh, deal with those accordingly. Um, I can see a question here. Is the SRO's exam annual like with the other assessments? No, it's intended to be a one-off at this stage. So hopefully it will stay that way. Um, so thank you for that question, um, Jennifer. Um, any other questions? If not, I'm going to hand you back to um, Kay from Jodasis, and uh, hopefully she's still there. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> no, thank you, Tracy. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I'll send out the um, slides over the next few days to all of you. Um, also, um, just a quick one, if you want to know how we can seamlessly help you with CQS through some of our tools, um, for example, like our SDLT solution, um, your uh, SDLT calculation will automatically um, go to another fee earner to verify your calculations, so it seamlessly helps you that way. Um, if you have any more questions for Tracy, um, I mean, please feel free to drop me a line and I'm more than happy to pass them on. And if we get any more questions, Tracy, um, through um, the chats, I'll send them on to you. That's fine. Just fire them over and then you can uh, you can send them out to everybody. But I'll send slides over um, so that you can distribute those um, later this afternoon. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. And I hope you enjoyed it. Thank and remember you. the three things. Say as you do. Do as you say and provide evidence. That's the one. Bye. Okay, have a good afternoon, everybody.